Good morning or good afternoon, indeed, wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to Android Heroes Live. My name is Lucy James. I'm part of the DroidCon Italy team, and it's the DroidCon Italy team who are bringing you this new Android Heroes Live show. What is Android Heroes Live? It's a monthly show focusing on all the news of Android and bringing you guest speakers from around the world. Each month, I'll be joined by a global, a global, a global speaker, absolutely, a worldwide expert and also an in-house Android expert. So we'll have the chance to do some nice in-house studio chat, a presentation and then Q&A with all of you. So get your questions ready, line them up. Today we're going to be speaking with Martin Brown from Stream, who's giving a presentation on Android complexity. So get your questions ready to ask him later, um, and we'll look, forward to, we'll look forward to that that's coming up shortly. As I say, this, um, this show is brought to you by the DroidCon Italy team. DroidCon Italy is produced by Advento Live, the events production service from Synesthesia. And this, this show is also sponsored by Bluetooth. We're very glad to have worked with Bluetooth for a number of years on, uh, on a variety of our events and shows. They're an excellent partner. They've been a great support to us as we've changed through the live event format to the digital format and now to these regular monthly shows. Um, so thank you very much for all of their support and we do look forward to our continued partnership. Now, um, as I say, here we are doing a live show. We've all seen this change um, in, in events over the last couple of years. Um, I was glad to see last night on the DroidCon Italy Twitter feed that some of our speakers, actually speakers that have been with us for years and from all over the world, back I am to global, um, had posted some pictures of, um, of group meetings at some of our events historically. Um, and lots of chat saying, oh, you know, we can't wait to, to meet up again and to be at that pizzeria near the, near the event venue, which was lovely to see. We hope for the same, but in the meantime, we wanted to make sure that we stay in touch with the community and um, that we're able to still provide you the great content that we know you enjoy. And so here we are with Android Heroes Live. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our in-house expert for today, Mirko. Android developer with Synesthesia. Mirko. Hi, I'm with Vendor here again uh, after I, DroidCon. <laughs> Perfect. I'm so glad to be with you as well because at DroidCon we were together on screen but not in person. Yeah. So we have taken a step forwards. Yeah, now I am here and uh, we can talk about uh, Google I.O. Perfect. <laughs> it's uh, Google has shown us many news about uh, what is Android and many other things. I will start talking about Android 12. Android 12 brings us a lot of new customization, UI customizations, and uh, now the UI in general is more fluid, anima animations are much better than before, and the old material design, which is all seven years old, um, it's uh, replaced by Material U. Then uh, we have uh, many other news, for example, uh, for privacy, because uh, now the user can switch between fine location and coarse location. For example, when you use a weather application, why you're asked for the extract position? So now the user on applications uh, which uh, doesn't uh, ask for exact position can uh, switch off uh, the exact one to give a coarse one. So the user is not identified in a single position. Then uh, there are many other news. For example, another great thing about the UI is that when you put a background on your phone, there is a um, process in the background which extrapolates the main colors and uh, the whole UI is set up with this color retrieved before. Uh, then uh, there are uh, other news uh, not on Android 12, but uh, for example uh, on uh, Project Lambda. Uh, we, in the every day, every day we use uh, the Google Assistant. Google Assistant uh, now is a bit robotic with uh, this new artificial intelligence, Google Assistant will provide much more uh, answers. These answers will be more um, accurate. And uh, in the keynote on uh, Google I.O., we've seen uh, that uh, the, the artificial intelligence itself personified a, a paper airplane and a planet. So there was a conversation between a human and a planet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was very, very cool. 
And then uh, we have many other news. For example, uh, in the future, we will uh, use uh, our phones as a key for open our cars. That, uh, yeah, this is awesome because uh, imagine you take your phone, you put on the car and it open up. That's it incredible. Up. It's incredible. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Google, it's, uh, it's very good in, in this period that they, they thrown out a lot of things and uh, I'm, very gl I'm very glad of it and uh, I want to develop new apps on Android 12 very bad. So you've had a very busy week, don't yeah. you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you were watching or involved with, I don't know if you attended how the event was organized, um, Google I.O. But I wanted to ask you about that, actually. Thank you. You've straight away, Merco's given us straight away all the key points from Google I.O. If you weren't there, you've had your summary. <laughs> um, but taking a step back for a minute, what was the, the event experience like? How, yeah, how was it? It was good because um, every Android developer should follow news about Android because uh, it's our everyday operating system. So uh, I've presented a keynote with all these news was very impressive because um, usually in the past uh, Google uh, presented news but not so, so big. For example, the material design, which is the UI present in Android in the, in the past seven years, was good but was old. It mm. was born old. Now this uh, design uh, is, um, which will be released uh, as a beta in the, um, on the new Pixel, uh, is uh, completely new because uh, the user will be more comfortable using uh, its phone, his phone, mm. and uh, the UI itself is more responsive. Uh, and um, yeah, it was uh, it was awesome. I have to say it was awesome. There were there were many news, and mm. these news were uh, all. All important at the same at the same time. So I get that there was there was a lot of news yeah. that came out. Um, you've already given us some of your highlights, yeah. but from those things you've listed, Merka, as a developer, yeah. what are the things that you're looking forward to getting most hands on? Okay, with? the first one is the possibility to switch off the course and find location, as I said before, because uh, it will be maybe difficult for us uh, developers, but for the user, it's a great uh, provide a great user experience. Mm. Then uh, I'd like to try another thing that will be in the stable version in the near future, which is Jetpack Compose. Jetpack uh, Compose, uh, and we talked about the Jetpack Compose at TroidCon 2. We certainly uh, did. <laughs> will be stable uh, next uh, July, and uh, it is uh, a new method to do Android application and Android UI, because uh, now we use XML and uh, from July, in, in fact, uh, we will try for sure. Uh, there is a new complete method for uh, making Android UI much easier, much faster, and uh, much more. Uh, it will be much more easier to handle animations, which uh, now it's uh, kind of pain <laughs> on Android. <Okay. laughs> so that will make your life as a developer yeah, yeah. much better. Much better, much easier, and yeah. uh, I hope uh, much interesting uh, <laughs> yeah. in uh, all the news are being presented. Okay, but that, that piece about Jetpack Compose, for yeah. example, how will that impact the users? The, uh, the user will have uh, an application mm -hmm. with a completely, design, completely new design because um, Jetpack Compose provides us uh, the possibility to make things completely new and uh, much more faster. So we can provide much uh, faster updates on mm -hmm. applications. The UI itself will be much uh, complex uh, and much more um, beautiful to see. Mm. So the, the user itself will, uh, will have a um, completely new life, I sure. hope so. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Now, we've mentioned before that you and I, we, we, we last saw each other, well, it's not we last saw each other, we last worked together, better to say, when we did the Joy-Con Italy yeah. show. Now, from then to Google I.O., what yeah. are the biggest developments that you've seen, the, the juiciest things that yeah, have changed? Yeah, Android 12 for sure. Okay. Because, uh, as I said before, it's a completely new redesign of mm -hmm. the whole operating system. And um, in the near future, all the, all the companies which uh, produce uh, phones uh, mm. will adapt uh, this kind of design because uh, with it will be, um, how can I say, it will be the, the main UI method for all the companies. And I think, uh, that uh, this new design uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, will um, make Google with Android 
much similar to iOS, uh, which is uh, the queen of the optimization in, um, in operative system world. Okay, so although we've seen change already, we can expect more change coming yeah. up. It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. It's always just the beginning. I, I think Google will, uh, will throw out a lot of new things in the future, and okay. I, I think that uh, there will be so new things that uh, it's awesome, it's awesome. Okay, that's cool. Now. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned to me when we were speaking just before we started the show um, about um, Google and Samsung working together yeah, on yeah. a new on a new watch. Is that correct? On a new watch, because Tell me. Um, Wear OS uh, has been a little bit shadowed because uh, it was not that good. Now, with the partnership between Google and Samsung, there will be a completely new user experience on smartwatch. Uh, with the fusion between a Tizen OS and Wear OS, uh, and um, I think that uh, will be a great improvement, uh, and uh, it will uh, allow Google to be more or less uh, such a, uh, like an um, Apple Watch. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I think that uh, there will be a great improvement uh, okay. in uh, Wear OS. Yeah. So specifically. Can you give me an example of what exactly is going to change? Uh, it, uh, it's going to change that uh, Samsung and Google will have a partnership in developing uh, the, the hardware okay. and the software. And, uh, oh, so if it's the hardware and the software <laughs> changing, everything's changing. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it will be a completely new experience. I've developed uh, applications on uh, Wear OS and sometimes uh, yeah. um, there were lags uh, or the watch itself uh, was uh, kind of hot. Yeah. And uh, because this is a uh, um, synonym of a bad optimization in the software. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, with this partnership, uh, this will improve and uh, we won't have uh, any problems in developing apps for Wear OS. Okay. And um, that was what I wanted to, to follow up with asking you is how it will change for you as a developer, apart from it being improved in general. Do you have any indication of specific ways in which this partnership will make a difference on the back end? Uh, for sure, with the use of Wear OS uh, mm. 3, because uh, we were uh, stopped at the version 2, and yeah. uh, the third version of Wear OS will provide uh, much more uh, fluidity in the system, mm. uh, much uh, better animations, uh, yeah. and also I think that uh, the battery life will uh, will be improved a lot. These uh, bring us the possibility to make, uh, to make applications uh, which are m more complex than before because yeah. uh, we have to, in the past uh, we had to stop when uh, we developed on the Wear OS and uh, I think that uh, with Wear OS 3 we will have uh, many news, uh, many great news. Okay, cool. Like as a developer and uh, a user. All right, so I mean, I never thought that your job was easy, but it just got harder. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> okay. We have to keep studying every day. <laughs> okay. Well, and fortunately, there are lots of ways to keep up with the things that you need to, to be in touch with and, exactly. and, stay, and stay up to date with. Exactly. Now, you very kindly um, used the word complexity, so you've segued me brilliantly into today's um, speaker. Yeah. Uh, we have um, Martin Brown joining us today from Stream. He should be joining us just now. He's going to be giving us a, spe uh, a presentation, not a speech, on Android complexity. Martin, are you there? Hey, yes, good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing great. Good. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And you're connecting with us from Hungary. That's right, isn't it? Yes, uh, I'm in Budapest this morning. Brilliant. How, how also, all, all, the, all the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> sure. We're, we're all where we are <laughs> all the time. How's Budapest looking this morning? Uh, good. Very, very sunny day. I had to close my blinds so that the camera can still see me. <laughs> Perfect. That's a nice problem to have. <laughs> um, and Martin and Mirko, have you guys met before? Let me do introductions before we go any further. We, we talked uh, before uh, we went here. Perfect. And, uh, I'd like to ask uh, something uh, to Martin, if is it possible. And um, Martin, tell me, you have seen the Google I.O., I think. Yes, I've been following. Um, what do you think about uh, Android 12 and the Material I.O.? Do you like the new design uh, or uh, you think it was better before? I'm excited that we're getting a change in the design. Uh, we, we haven't had like major system UI changes in a while. Uh, there are some parts of it that still feel very weird to me, 
uh, things like the sparkle effects uh, whenever a ripple happens or the stretching that happens when you over scroll a list. Yeah. I'm, I'm not convinced that those are good ideas, but I assume that we're going to get them in the final version. Um, so we'll just have to get used to them. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that the rest of the system is getting overhauled, though. Um, I'm running the beta on a pixel. Uh, don't daily drag this, by the way. It's a very bad idea. Uh, there are some serious bugs. Uh, but yeah, I, I already like uh, how the system UI looks. Uh, it's really fresh. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's just pleasant to use. It's, it's something new, finally. Yeah, it's, uh, I think uh, it's awesome as you. And um, well, I have uh, to say that uh, I was impressed too by the annunciation of partnership between Samsung and Google on uh, Wear OS, uh, on the new Wear OS and smartwatch. Do you use um, a smartwatch or you stick with the old, uh, <laughs> all the old ones? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I used to use a Wear OS watch uh, until about a year ago, uh, which is when I got tired of it. Uh, okay. it, it. It had some serious usability issues. Uh, I, I also bought a cheaper one, so maybe maybe it was it was nicer on the high end, but um, I, I didn't really enjoy it just because it was not performing well. The the features were good. The UI was 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 pretty nice, uh, but it it kept crashing. It kept freezing up. So. Yeah. Uh, that that wasn't good. Uh, I have a smartwatch now, which is a non Wear OS watch. Uh, um, and maybe I'll go back to Wear OS uh, with all of these changes. We'll have to see uh, what hardware they actually ship. It would have been nice if they already announced uh, new, new watches as well, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, yeah, because uh, I think that uh, the main problem with the old smartwatch, uh, smartwatches was the, um, the hardware, because uh, Snapdragon now is delivering us some good uh, CPUs for uh, our watch because uh, with the older version uh, we have uh, some serious problems. I've made uh, two apps on uh, Wear OS and uh, it's one, it was kind of pain. <laughs> um, another, th another, thing, uh, uh, another thing is, uh, will you use a Jetpack Compose in the future when it becomes stable? Oh yes, I'm, I'm very, very interested in Jetpack Compose. I... I never had a problem with the XML layouts, but the theming system with, with classic Android uh, has, has always been painful for me. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, Jetpack Compose. Uh, it's also like a, a super Kotlin thing, which is, which is also, uh, of course, uh, great to use. Um, so yeah, I've been playing around with it. Uh, we at Stream have been playing around with it uh, in general, and we'll be looking at it very closely. And uh, yeah, um, I'm... Like I, I spent some of this week writing an article about Jetpack Compose, um, so I'm like all aboard the Compose train. I can't wait for it to be stable. Uh, I'm I'm a bit surprised that it's supposed to go stable in July. It feels a bit early, uh, but yeah, uh, we'll we'll have to see. Awesome. What do you think about Compose so far? I think it will be very good because uh, XML is a good method to do layouts, but uh, I think it's kind of deprecated. It's uh, time to innovate and uh, I think Jetpack Compose will help us in uh, making uh, some good layout in a much more easier way. Well, before we go any further, I can see the robot that's behind Martin just there. Um, and. You, if I'm not wrong, Mirko, you mentioned that there was an update with regards to the um, Google AI making a voice like a planet. Yeah. Someone has got to tell me what that means, please. Yeah, I think uh, she's talking about a project Lambda. Have you seen yeah, that? All, oh. yeah, all I know is what I saw on the keynote. Uh, it, it, it was a fun demo, and Assistant can certainly use some improvements. Um, I. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, I'll, I'll wait for it to actually ship and, and give us some real life changes. Uh, but the demos are very cool and, and very fun. Yeah. Good. Well, I think that um, the talk that you're going to be sharing with us today, Martin, makes perfect sense, especially in the context of this week. Like we've just been talking about, there's a lot of new news in Android. There's often a lot of new yeah. news, but there really is this week. And you're going to share with us your thoughts on Android complexity and more importantly, how to overcome it and, uh, and, and plan for the best, the best project possible. Yes, uh, that's, that's exactly uh, what I'm going to cover. Uh, just 
like the whole wild world of Android that we're supposed to follow and take care of it. Brilliant. Well, look, you have a great presentation. We're going to speak again afterwards um, when we'll take Q&A both from the studio and from the, um, from the participants, those who, are, those who are watching. Everybody that's watching, get your questions ready because um, Martin will be ready to answer them afterwards. Martin, have a great presentation. Thank you. All right, uh, let's get to it. Um, so uh, my name is Martin Brown. This is Android Complexity. And uh, when I initially started uh, this uh, presentation, uh, it was just going to be a longer rant about all the like complex and uh, difficult things and just a like, huge number of things that we have to care about when we are developing Android applications. Uh, but then to actually make it a somewhat useful talk and not just make everyone listen to me rant about this, uh, I, I grabbed a couple concepts um, that make it make more sense. So the pitch here is that if you're a product developer, if you're working on an existing product, uh, then you can uh, take a look at this list of things and uh, improve and polish your uh, existing app using them. And if you're um, starting new projects a lot, uh, maybe if you work as, as an agency or at an agency, um, then you can use this list of things to better plan and estimate your next project. Um, because, well, there's nothing worse than planning to do a lot of things right on a project. Like, sure, we're going to do testing, we're going to do uh, accessibility and all of that, uh, and then having to drop it along the way because there's no time. Um, so having having a long list of things uh, that you know you could do in a project helps you uh, better prepare for it. Now, I'm going to breeze through a lot of things here, uh, which is the point of the talk. And I've grouped it very loosely into categories. And I'm going to start with UX. Within UX, accessibility deserves the first mention. And if you've ever written layouts on Android, and placed an image view in them, you've already met some of the accessibility features of the framework. Um, because um, the uh, lint warnings in Studio immediately complain if you don't place uh, content descriptions on your images, um, which is a good thing. Uh, this is very helpful for people who use screen readers on their phones. Um, one of my personal uh, gripes with accessibility is step targets. Um, Material Design actually has a recommendation of using at least 48 dps uh, as the size of every tappable area, uh, even if the icons are smaller on your design. If your designers like very minimal, um, like small icons uh, on their screens, uh, you can still pad them so that the actual tappable area is larger. And these kinds of uh, accessibility uh, improvements uh, actually improve your app for all of your users. Um, so you don't uh, have to think about just uh, users who have some kind of uh, permanent uh, disability uh, that prevents them from um, using apps easily. Uh, but this is also really useful for just everyday users uh, when they're in certain situations. Um, so let's say that your user is using their phone uh, with one hand. Maybe they're on a moving vehicle because they're commuting. Um, having like decently sized step targets and uh, easily navigatable UIs uh, will also uh, help them a lot too. So any accessibility improvement you make will help all of your users and make your app better for everyone. Uh, speaking of very long words, uh, let's go to internationalization next. Um, this again makes your app more available to more people. Um, and the very baseline you can do here is to use string resources properly. Uh, which uh, makes your app translatable to other languages um, in comparison to hard coding all of your strings. Uh, then you should think about date formats if you want to be international. Um, there are many, many date formats around the world. Um, so users have different expectations in different regions. Uh, something related to dates is the start of the week. It's very easy to assume that weeks will start on Mondays or on Sundays, um, but you can't make these assumptions uh, because, again, this uh, depends. And there are also some locales where text flows from right to left, uh, which can also be quite an investment to support. Um, you have to think about your UI being flipped um, the other way around and uh, also take care of that. Again, to highlight something very specific with string resources, uh, I really like the plurals system in Android resources, uh, which allows you to use different strings based on a quantity uh, in your application. Uh, so for example, if you want to display a message about the number of songs you found, 
um, you can use a quantity plural uh, or you can use a plural resource um, and set different strings for the singular quantity, which has a different uh, uh, different uh, grammatical rule in English, and also all other quantities. And you can um, make this dynamic in your code like that. Uh, this is controlled by this quantity attribute uh, in the plurals. And there are actually a lot of these different uh, attributes you can use. Uh, there are languages that have concepts of a few items or many items, and uh, they have to uh, like form the sentence around those quantities differently. Uh, so this, again, is something really complex, but something that Android helps you out a lot with, thankfully. Uh, then let's talk about dark theme. Uh, by this time, uh, users have very strong expectations that your app should support dark theme. Uh, this has been going on for a couple of years now. And it's also a good idea to uh, support switching themes inside your application um, so that users can force a light or a dark theme if they want. Or uh, you can also allow them to follow the system settings. Or you can also do things uh, like let them um, tie this to the battery level so that when the battery uh, goes uh, goes into um, like a battery saver mode because uh, it's low, uh, then you can go to uh, dark mode as well uh, so that you save a bit of that battery. Then let's talk about animations. Uh, we mentioned this briefly in the conversations before the talk. Um, the problem with animations on Android is captured really nicely by this Twitter conversation, uh, which was two years ago, but is just as current today. Um, the most difficult part about implementing them is probably to decide which of the many, many APIs to use um, to actually uh, write the code. And if you go around uh, Googling for um, different Android APIs, you're going to find articles like this. Uh, which is a cheat sheet for different Android animation APIs. And inside this article, you'll find this kind of flowchart uh, to make your decision. And I'm not even going to go through this. Um, you can just see that there's a lot of different options and questions and a lot of different APIs, all the way from motion layout to value animators. Um, and the good news, uh, as, as good as it can be, is that this flowchart actually just captures a talk from Android Dev Summit from 2018. Uh, which goes through all of these APIs and explains why and how you should use all of them for different use cases. Um, so at least there's a good starting point um, in this case. One of my pet peeves with animations is that they can be disabled. Um, let's take, for example, this screen where you have just a default progress bar widget um, in the middle. If you run this same application on an Android device that has animations disabled, uh, you're going to see this uh, static icon, which to me at least looks like a refresh icon. And I've encountered this while building an Android application. Uh, I got a screenshot of this icon showing up in the app um, and uh, someone complaining about it. And I, as the user, as the developer of that app, couldn't tell how that icon got there because I, I didn't realize that a progress bar would look so different when animations are disabled. And users disable this for a variety of reasons. Um, they might do it for accessibility reasons, or uh, they just feel like their device is faster if animations are disabled. So it's a good idea to test what your app behaves like if animations are off and what it even looks like. Um, also, if you're tying things like navigation to um, the duration of animations, uh, having them disabled can also do weird things in the app. Then, of course, when we talk about UX and UI these days, we have to talk about Jetpack Compose. Uh, this is another choice you have, that you have to make. Uh, we're in this transitional phase where Compose is coming up, but it's not stable yet. Um, so you have to make decisions about whether to use the old, like regular view system or to build things in Jetpack Compose. And we can actually combine these last two topics because uh, there's also animations in Jetpack Compose, uh, which are supposed to be easy, but then you go to the documentation and you see this flowchart which looks at least as complicated as the previous one we had with, with the old animation APIs. Um, so yeah, just one more thing to uh, think about and uh, another large set of APIs to learn. Uh, of course, it's great that we have these kinds of charts, but you do have to know about a lot of different uh, possible ways to do things again. OK, uh, for the next category, I'm, I've called this platform, which is just going to contain a lot of very Android, very classic Android problems. And the first one of that is going to be state restoration, uh, which happens in a bunch of different places in Android. 
Uh, we all learn about configuration changes quite early on in our Android developer careers, um, especially orientation changes. Uh, you learn that whenever the screen is rotated, activities are destroyed, you're going to lose all your data, and you somehow have to take care of that. Of course, orientation changes are not the only configuration change that can happen on a device. There's also things like toggling dark mode or the language or changing the font size, and all of those will also recreate your activities. Uh, these are mostly solved by view models these days, but there's also a larger state restoration cycle, which is through process death, which again is something that you should test for uh, separately, and you should make sure that your app can uh, behave nicely whenever that happens. I have two talk recommendations for uh, state restoration. Uh, one of them is reactive state management using Jetpack components by Gabor Varady. And the other one is Falsehoods Android Developers Believe About Life Cycles by Andrew Bailey. Uh, this will be in the uh, links uh, that I'm uh, going to be sharing at the end of the talk. You can also just search for both of them on YouTube. A very classic Android problem to have is having to support a lot of different screens. Um, we have a wide variety of physical screen sizes and also a lot of different um, screen resolutions. Uh, so we have all of these size classes to uh, take into account, uh, both when designing apps and when implementing those designs. Um, different sizing and resolutions also result in a variety of um, screen densities. So we're used to having to ship our image assets in a lot of different uh, variants and a lot of different sizes. Uh, this can be somewhat solved by just using vector uh, images instead, but those are not applicable all the time, so we might still uh, occasionally have to do this sort of thing. And because the uh, variety of screens wasn't enough, uh, a couple of years ago, notches appeared on the screen, and we got the appropriate APIs for it and the system, uh, so we can query how many notches there are on the screen, uh, where they are, and uh, how large they are, um, so that we can avoid and throwing content under them. And of course, because that wasn't enough either, uh, we now also have cutout cameras and we have folding phones. Um, so like all the more complexity to think about. Um, with folding phones, if you want to really perfect your UI, uh, like you see in the examples here, uh, you can adapt to the phone being folded. There's also APIs for that. Um, yeah, again, just a lot of corner cases to um, think about. And because hardware variety is not enough either, uh, we have some software settings that uh, affect how your apps are displayed. Uh, we have a font size and a display size setting in Android. Uh, display size is sort of new in the last three or four versions, and font size has uh, always existed. Um, here's an example of a screen uh, where I'm changing the font size from the lowest to the largest uh, setting. Um, and as you can see, there's the title of uh, the podcast episode in the middle, which is being scaled up. Um, that um, is being broken into uh, multiple lines. It's pushing the rest of the UI down. And the uh, long description text on the bottom is also being resized uh, since the font size is changing. Uh, this is something that most developers know about. And remember to uh, check that their UI can handle it, hopefully. And there's also changing the display size, which scales up all of your elements on the screen. Um, so here you can see that the toolbar is getting larger, as well as the cover art, the buttons, and also the text. Um, so uh, you should really uh, test your apps uh, with the extreme settings of font size and display size, and also the like extreme combinations of these, uh, maybe the largest display size or the smallest font size and things like that, and see if your UI still uh, looks presentable or maybe something breaks uh, when, when you try these settings. Something really cool on Android is app shortcuts, and I don't see them being used a lot. Um, you can make these app shortcuts uh, in your launcher fairly static. Uh, here's Google Maps, which lets me navigate to work or home easily. Um, but you can also make these very dynamic. For example, Spotify can offer the playlists that the user has been listening to the most recently. Um, as app shortcuts. So this, again, is something you should consider for your app. If there are actions that have to be performed a lot and you don't want your users to have to open the app and then like find the action there, um, you can put them into shortcuts. And you can also populate it with recent user data. Uh, maybe if you're a messaging app, you can uh, put the recent, uh, recently messaged uh, list of people there uh, to quickly jump back into that. 
uh, notifications are an like um, a constant topic on Android. Um, we love them because they change on every single OS version. They always look different. Uh, we know that uh, they have uh, this default look uh, where you can have a title and you can have some context. Um, and um, you can uh, place um, a bunch of text in it, or you can have some rich media like images. And there are also special notification types. If you're a messaging app, for example, or a media player, and there are uh, special uh, styles of not notifications for both of those, uh, which can include um, suggested replies and inline replies. Uh, for media apps, it can include the playback controls and cover art. Um, and that's um, all things that you should test uh, on different versions. Uh, this week, we are, uh, we've had Google I.O. And we, of course, got another overhaul uh, of the system UI, including the notification UI on Android 12. So again, uh, this adds another OS version that you should be running to see what your app's notifications look like. Uh, notifications since Android 8 uh, have to be sent into notification channels, uh, which is a great thing for users because they can control the different types of notifications that your app sends uh, individually. They can uh, just uh, switch them off completely or change the way that they are notified about each kind of event. I didn't want to shame any apps here, uh, so I brought two good examples, uh, which you should be following. Uh, you can see that in both of these uh, applications, there is a very nice detailed breakdown of the different types of notifications, uh, which is very convenient for users. Uh, please don't be the app that has a notification channel that's just called notifications and sends all of their stuff there. Uh, background work is something a bit too exciting on Android. It would be great if it was boring. Um, there are, again, a lot of different services, a lot of different managers that you can use uh, to schedule things to be done uh, at some point uh, for your app to be vacant up in, in some way to perform some work. And uh, this, of course, is also being changed in every OS release, including Android 12 again. Um, so again, a very deep topic to learn about. And the first time you encounter that you want to like do something an hour from now, uh, you're going to go. Uh, down this rabbit hole of all of these different existing APIs. Then, of course, Android is not just phones. Um, we talked about uh, Vero OS in the intro and um, supporting Vero OS and shipping an app uh, for smartwatches is also a possibility for you, especially if you're a fitness app or a media playback application. Uh, for example, uh, it could be really handy to also ship a Vero OS app alongside your uh, regular Android phone app. Um, and if you're a game or a media app, uh, integrating with Android TV can also be uh, something that uh, makes your user experience better. And of course, you can also take your apps on the road with Android Auto, um, which um, is interesting to you, mostly if you're a media app, maybe if you're a messaging app. Uh, if you're a media application and you're doing things correctly, um, on, on the phone and you're using all of the system media APIs, uh, integrating with Android Auto is actually shockingly easy. Um, it, it can be done with a couple lines of code for basic integration. So it's something you should look at. Then let's talk about inputs for a moment. Um, we like to assume that our users are using a smartphone, uh, maybe a tablet, but those are not super popular on Android these days. Um, but not all of our users are going to be using a phone in the way that uh, we think they are. Uh, for example, you know that you're going to have users like this if you're an Android developer, um, because Android has had great support for things like keyboards and mice and uh, external inputs like that for a long while now. Um, so if you're a productivity application, uh, maybe a text editor, a to-do app, or something like that, uh, you should be prepared for these kinds of users, and you should support them with uh, good keyboard navigation across the different UI elements, uh, maybe keyboard shortcuts. Um, that's just something else to think about. And if you're a game, you should really think about adding controller support if it's possible, um, because there are a lot of supported controllers. Again, uh, like historically, Android has always been very good at this, uh, supporting controllers from different consoles and so on. In the next section, uh, let's talk a bit about QA as in uh, quality assurance. Um, these are things that you can do within your app to make the code base uh, nicer. Um, the first step here is, is static analysis, which mostly happens while you're coding. 
Um, if you want to do this at the basic level, uh, you can just look at the warnings uh, that Lint produces within Android Studio and hopefully address those. Um, just not having any warnings in your code uh, inside Studio will probably make your code base healthier. Uh, you can also have a lot of external tools uh, for this. Uh, you can do this individually or at the team level. Uh, you can use things like Detect or Sonar. Um, the list is uh, kind of endless. Then there's unit testing, which is the first step into having automated checks in your application, um, usually for an individual class. And learning unit tests from scratch is actually quite, quite complex. Uh, you have to learn about JUnit. Uh, there's JUnit 4 and 5. You can mix them. You can choose between them. Um, you have to weigh the pros and cons of that. Uh, you can also use test frameworks outside of JUnit if you want. Um, there are like Kotlin-specific test frameworks with different testing styles. Um, you have to learn about replacing dependencies. Uh, if you haven't learned dependency injection yet, unit tests are probably going to be the place where you have to learn them uh, or learn it. Um, there's all sorts of mocking libraries uh, that you can use. Uh, you have to learn about mocks and spies and fakes in the first place. Um, you have a lot of different assertion libraries you can use to make your checks. Um, so it's, it's, again, a very complex topic. And you have to find the, the tools that you want to use there for yourself. And then there are UI tests, uh, which have all of the complexity of unit tests. But you also have to have a device running in some way. Uh, whether that's an emulated device or a real device, uh, whether it's local or it's running in the cloud somewhere, um, you have to take care of that. And you also have to learn to interact with the UI in some way. Uh, for example, you have to learn about how Espresso works. A good thing to do to make sure that your app is behaving nicely is to performance profile it every once in a while. Um, this can be, again, done inside Studio at the very basic level, which is great news because you don't need external tools, although there are a lot of them. Um, but inside Studio, you can check things like the CPU and the memory usage of your application uh, to make sure that uh, no unexpected work is happening, the CPU isn't spiking when you expect it to be idle. Um, and something really useful is that you can track network requests here as well. Um, so you can uh, notice here if your app is making too many requests, if it's uh, like going to the server every two seconds for something that it uh, doesn't actually have to refresh. Um, that's something you can spot here and then fix in your application. Uh, then uh, the APK size is also something uh, you should uh, revisit sometimes. Uh, we tend to add more and more features into our applications, uh, which come with more and more assets and more dependencies. and uh, more native libraries as well. Uh, and all of this can rapidly increase our application size. Um, and for every kilobyte, every megabyte that you add to your ap application, you're going to lose some of your user base uh, because not everyone has a lot of space on their phone uh, for storing apps. And there are also uh, strict network limitations and uh, slow networks around the world uh, where people will just stop updating your application if it keeps using a lot of their data and it's taking forever. Um, so make sure that you try to keep your APK size under control. Uh, app bundles help with this a lot by splitting according to the device uh, device's requirements so that not all of the resources are shipped to the device. But you also might want to consider things like dynamic feature modules um, to just exclude different features from the package that you're shipping to your users by default. Uh, let's talk a bit then about developer tooling and the choices you have to make there. And the first choice would, of course, be the language. Uh, you can choose to develop an Android app in Java or in Kotlin. Um, OK, so well, this slide is really just a joke here. Uh, at this point, we know which way Android is going. Um, so the good news is that this is at least a choice that you don't have to worry about anymore. Something you should think about, though, is version control. Uh, whether you're developing things alone or in a team, uh, version control should be a must, uh, should be a basic thing that you're using in your project. Um, it's, it's a great way to uh, go back in history and take a look at the changes you're making uh, to develop different features in parallel. Um, and it also um, serves as just a backup solution. If you have something in version control, um, you're just less likely to lose all of your code. Once you've done that, uh, it's quite easy to set up uh, continuous integration on top of your version control so that whenever you push code, 
um, some automated checks will happen on your code. Um, it will be built automatically if you have tests, and those can be automatically executed. And there are a bunch of free solutions for this uh, these days, as long as you're developing open source code. And you can also go a step further and use continuous delivery from here if you have the setup. Um, because um, from here, you can also uh, do release builds and deploy it to Firebase app testing, for example, or to the Play Store or anything like that. Speaking of deploying your application, uh, you should also consider using uh, different stores. And uh, there is Google Play, which is like the standard place to be on an Android phone. But there's also Amazon's and Samsung own stores. And there's also Huawei's own store. Uh, the Huawei App Gallery is an especially uh, interesting place to be um, because it's available on some devices that don't have Google Play services on it. Um, and in this case, you have to ship a version of your application if you want to support those devices. Uh, that doesn't rely on any Google APIs, which means no Firebase notifications, no Firebase in general, um, no Google Fuse location, no Google Maps. Um, so for all of these features, uh, you would have to substitute some kind of third-party solutions in your application. And it presents a lot of problems, like do you want to ship both integrations in the same app? Do you want to uh, build different packages for these different stores? Um, again, uh, more and more considerations around an app. Once you've managed to publish your app, it's a great idea to have some crash reporting with it, um, just to know if it's failing in the hands of your users and to see what the most common issues are and to hopefully get it fixed as soon as possible. The better, happier side of monitoring your app would be app analytics. Um, so adding uh, analytics events to places in your app that you care about so that you can check uh, which features are being used the most by your users if you have flows in your app, uh, checking uh, at which step do uh, users drop off, uh, what things do they not complete. Um, this is great to determine the uh, improvements you should be making in your app um, and to like measure if a new feature was popular enough and if it was worth developing. OK, uh, let me wrap this all up. Um, so my pitch with this long list of things, which is by no means exhaustive, I've like just grazed the surface uh of a lot of these things on android uh so the point was uh, that you can use these things to either improve your product that already exists or you can use it as a starter checklist of sorts uh when you're going to start a new project but what i really want to bring all of this back to is that you really don't have to know everything about android development um, it can be overwhelming to try to learn all of the libraries all of the tools all of the different areas of the platform and in practice, you're not going to use all of this. Not all of your apps are going to have Bluetooth and uh, networking and uh, animations and, and all of that, and accessibility and tests and, and instrumentation tests. Um, so you're better off just like building a base level awareness of things that exist um, so that whenever you actually need them, uh, you can go and learn more about it. Uh, this week's Google I.O. is a good example of this. Here's the playlist uh, as of this morning of just the Android-related content from Google I.O. And it doesn't actually include all of the talks yet. Um, just going through this uh, takes hours and hours of time. Uh, and Google I.O. is, again, just one of the conferences around Android. So uh, don't try to follow everything all at once. Um, like Pick your battles and just check out the interesting parts that you need currently. All right, uh, that's a wrap. I had a bunch of references uh, in this talk. You can find all of that on my website's talks page. And you can also follow me on Twitter for Android and Kotlin stuff, and also uh, me talking about um, Jetpack Compose and Streams Chat SDK and uh, all of that. And that's Android complexity. Thanks for attending. Brilliant, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I actually, I immediately wanted to ask you if your slides, if your talk was going to be available on, uh, on one of your websites. And you gave us that link at the end. So thank you very much. Um, I imagine you've got lots of material on there. Is that right? Um, yes, uh, I have all of my existing talks there. Um, also, the slides for this one and um, links I showed along the way uh, to different great talks. OK, perfect. Thank you. That is an amazing resource for, um, for anyone that wants to, like you said, you know, pick their battles. 
um, and, uh, and, and get to learn a little bit more. So thank you very much. Um, there is still time to post your questions um, in the chat bar, the Q&A bar that you see um, on your screen. So please do so if you've got a question for Martin based on, on his presentation. Meanwhile, I just want to ask you something, if I may, um, Martin, while I've got, while I've got you. <laughs> um, I have personally noticed a trend in the last couple of years of talks from our, our Android experts being focused a bit more like yours today on, on, on the sort of soft skills area, how to manage your work, how to, how to improve in your work. Um, more so than pe perhaps some of the technical elements of development. And I just wondered if you've got a comment on that, if there's a, a reason for that trend or, you know, have we reached peak technical information? <laughs> um, or if, there, yeah, just if you've got a comment on that, please. Uh, yeah, I, I think we, we still get the, uh, like, ample coverage about technical things that we need. There's just, uh, like, so many speakers and so many uh talks happening and so much content coming out in general that there's also a healthy space uh, for for these soft skills and, and uh, management things and uh, things like that. And uh, well, at, at some point, you also have to learn those. Uh, I, I think that it's very valuable uh, that we can talk about um, how to actually manage a team of developers uh, or um, how to how to build larger projects, not from the not just from the technical side, but um, how to uh, plan them out, how to coordinate with different teams within your organization. Um, all of those things can be can be difficult tasks. And well, we have to learn it at some point. Uh, it's it's not enough that that we learn uh, like the programming languages and the platform APIs. Um, if if a project gets large enough, if if you're building a serious product with a lot of people, uh, there has to be a, a strong emphasis on on how you're working together. Sure. So do you think that those that, that soft skill piece, the, the people management, the personal development, has that always been important or and is that just it's just it's coming to the surface now? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're just seeing the trend of of more and more people uh, wanting to talk more about this. Uh, it, it was always important. Uh, it just maybe wasn't necessarily covered uh, sure. at our technical conferences. But it's actually actually really refreshing to do, go to these kinds of talks. Um, like if, if you're spending your, your whole day at a conference, uh, having one of two talks that uh, aren't all about coding and APIs and, and SDKs uh, can be quite refreshing and relaxing. It's just yeah. good to break the pace. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's, um, it's refreshing. It's also very important. Um, so. So I think that's a good mix. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your talk as well. Um, I'm going to pass over to Merko now um, to see if he's got some more technical questions for you. Merko, over to you. Hi, Martin. Um, I hey. just have uh, one question. Um, what are the main benefits of uh, dark mode on non-AMOLED screen? Because uh, we all know that AMOLED will provide uh, battery life savior for uh, but we will extend the battery life. But on LED screen, there are any other benefits? Um, I, I believe that you get some battery improvements there as well, uh, just not as significant as on AMOLED screens. Um, also, I think people just like it. It's it's a very aesthetic thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. If if your whole rest of the OS and all of your your other apps are in dark mode, it's it's nice to be able to choose that for. Uh, applications um, and like just very, very everyday, very practical use cases. Just using your phone in the evening and at night, you like don't want to um, stare at a lit up like bright white rectangle. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it was a little curiosity, no, nothing important. Uh, thank you for your talk, uh, for your time. So I have, um, I don't think we've got any questions that have come in from, from the audience at the moment. I'm sure that if other people have got questions, they can ask you on Twitter, Martin, or, or they can find you on your website. So there's always a chance um, to ask those questions. I'm going to wrap up with one final question. It's actually for both of you. We've talked about there being a lot of news um, in Google and with Google I.O. And Martin, you kindly tried to figure out how to manage that complexity. Let's just take a moment to think about new developers, people who are totally new 
um, to this sector. They're just starting out. Now, Martin, you already gave a little bit of advice on this, you know, pick your battles, try to focus on the most important things. But I wanted to ask you as well, Merka, for people who are new developers, how do they figure out um, all of this, you know, this complex market, all these different things? What's the best way to start? Well, the best way to start is study. Just to know how Android works, because mm -hmm. uh, we have to know how Android works. And then uh, um, always be in touch with new technologies mm -hmm. and uh, always know uh, what are the latest news. For example, next July we will have Jetpack Compose. Mm -hmm. People can start uh, watching it because I'm sure that it will be very important for Android developers in the future. So study and uh, be interested in uh, what you do. Okay, okay. So stay, stay in touch, basically. Yeah. And Martin, have you got anything you'd like to add to, to the many things you've already said on the subject? Um, well, it's, it's about trying to find the resources that work best for you, um, like depending on whether you like to go through books that guide you through building a couple apps or you like to watch uh, long form talks or, or short content. Um, you you want to read blog posts about uh, individual things you can do. Um, it, at, at the beginning, it's, it's really about finding the, the, the best way to learn for you. And then it's up to sorting out all of the resources that exist, uh, which is crazy these days. Uh, you're, you're probably best off starting with Google's materials if you're a beginner. Um, they, they have uh, very beginner-friendly things these days. Um, but yeah, there's, there's an endless, endless amount of things to learn from. <laughs> that's, yeah. that, that's a very current problem. We're lucky, aren't we, that there are all of, all of these resources, like you say, from a classic book all the way to short form, bite-sized videos um, to learn from. Brilliant. Um, well, look, Martin, thank you so much um, you. for your time today. Thank you for sharing everything you did with us. Um, and we will look forward to working with you again in the future, perhaps on other Android Heroes um, shows, perhaps on DroidCon Italy, or who knows where in the world. But good luck with all of your projects, and, uh, and, and we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was great. Pleasure. And Mirko as well, thank you so much for your time today. You're uh, welcome. Um, I, all, I really, really enjoyed our chats when we did Joy-Con Italy together, and it's been so nice to do it in person. Yeah, it will be nice to do again in the future, to e do it again in the future. Exactly right. Well, I'll book you in for our next Android Heroes Live. There you go. You said you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. So that's a wrap for our first Android Heroes live show. We will be back in the studio next month, June the 18th for our next Android Heroes live with another global expert and another in-house expert as well, bringing you all the latest Android news and plus some highlights in a, in a focus talk. In the meantime, I would just like to thank Bluetooth, um, who are the sponsor for, for this show. Thank you for their continued support. This show was brought to you by Advento Live, um, the events production team from Synesthesia, who also produced DroidCon Italy. And just to close, to let you know that Call for Papers for DroidCon Italy 2021 is now open. So if you are keen to be a DroidCon Italy speaker on a round table, give a keynote, let us know what you've got. Call for Papers is open and we look forward to your submissions. Thank you very much and see you next time.